One of my great privileges as Chief Minister is the Territorians I get to meet and the personal stories they choose to share with me. It's never more important to listen than when someone is facing incredibly difficult times. And these are tough times for Territory tough people. At the start of the year, I had a meeting with a local business person. They were very blunt. They leant forward and they said to me, at tough times like this, we expect government to take the blow. I get it. My government gets it. Right now, you want a government that will invest in you, in the things that matter to you, into creating jobs, into cutting crime. You want to know what's happening now and what's happening in 2019. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening in the year ahead and in the kits that you've been given, there's a lot more detail as well. Over the last 20 years, we have seen three major economic driven booms in the NT. The railway into Conoco, into Impex. And there are a couple of truisms about all of them. It always hurts to come out the other side. Our economy always ends up stronger than it was when we began and there's always a rebound. We know there are more good days ahead of us than there are bad. The Impex project was easily the biggest boom that we've had. At peak, over 10,000 workers, 10% of our local workforce. This was a big project. And it's critical now that we create local jobs and we prepare our economy better to survive the next major projects that we know are coming. At the start of our term, we recognise the critical importance of the government spend to the economy. We know right now when times are tough, stretching that government dollar as much as we can, as local as possible, is critical. So we now have the strongest by local laws and territory history, and I believe the strongest in the nation. And critically, we also employed, employed, appointed, for the first time, a bi-local advocate to hold us to account to what we said we would do, but also to hold account those people who win tenders. If you made a promise to employ a local subby on your job, we want to make sure you've employed that local subby. At the start of this year, I took on the business portfolios. That gives me personal and direct lead on buy local and cutting red tape. I've already caught up with our buy local advocate about how we can make our laws stronger again. And I'm obviously working with local business around those questions of red tape, beige tape, green tape, black tape, all the colours of tape. And we will do that. You'll see more from us soon and across the year. It's also critical we keep the cash flowing. We know how important cash flow is. Money in people's pockets, money in your tills. Stimulus projects are geared for that. We know the three sectors, not, no one's immune, but the three sectors that have probably been hit the hardest are construction, retail and hospitality. From the start of the term we've had a bigger, better home improvement scheme. We've had the home renovation grant scheme for first home buyers. We've had the immediate works grant scheme that's helped a lot of community groups out. We've had the smart energy grants. We've had the steel stimulus for the manufacturing sector. Right now, the $100 million for the housing stimulus has started rolling from the beginning of this year. Work designed to cover a range of packages there, so we know how important it is to make sure the work we put out is of a variety that suits as many territory businesses as possible. In that same thinking, we have for the second time pulled forward a range of major projects to make sure the pipeline is there. So just yesterday, uh, Litchfield National Park, the road that unloads those, unlocks those three campgrounds, uh, Mandora Jetty, Adam Palmerston, Zicoli Primary School brought forward, New Palmerston um, Fire Station down in Alice Springs, uh, expanding the Kilgariff residential blocks, which are selling at two a month. And we're going to run out if we don't expand that. So bringing forward those major projects, they will support what we're doing in Nightcliff with the knocking down of John Stokes Square early this year and the new police station that we're doing there. So a pipeline of works for those local construction jobs. The other thing that's still rolling is our turbocharging 
tourism. Specially designed knowing that some of the consequences out of the impacts construction phase wind down was going to be more seats on planes that were empty into the territory and empty hotel rooms. We want people to visit the territory from outside the territory with their money and spend money in our local shops and our local restaurants. We saw last year, for example, record crowds at Darwin Festival and at Parchma in Alice. That still rolls this year, and as a cabinet, we are considering to make up the shape, the design of a turbocharging Mark II. How do we keep working in this area? These are the critical things that we're doing to keep the cash flowing locally. But while we do that, we also have to make sure we put in the architecture that stabilises our economy, that evens out the peaks and troughs that Claire just spoke about. This goes to diversifying our economy and investing in infrastructure across the Northern Territory. This is about more than just emerging industries. It is exciting that this year we'll see test launches out at our new space base and next year commercial launches and launches by NASA. It is exciting that this year we'll see $80 billion in solar farms being built down at Catherine and at Batchelor, and we'll see our use of renewable energy go from 3% to 10%. These are the smart jobs of the future. And it's also exciting to know that in the next couple of weeks you'll see tenders for construction awarded both at Lejeune and at Bino for Project Sea Dragon. That prawn farm is real. You can see those tangible steps for that prawn farm this year. When completed, that prawn farm will be worth the equivalent of our live cattle trade. This is an extraordinary project. So new and emerging industries. But it is also important we keep investing in those traditional drivers of our economy. They've got to be strong to help smooth out these peaks and troughs. Let's take what we already do good and do better. Tourism. How do we keep lengthening the tourist season and increase the amount of tourists we get full stop? There's three things I want to touch on here. I've already mentioned turbocharging. The first is our military history. We know there is a lot of interest in what's happened here in Darwin and the Northern Territory through war. For the first time this year, we'll have the Territory Tribute, which is a series of events from Bombing of Darwin Day through to Anzac Day. The date I'd like you to put in the calendar is Anzac Eve. For the first time, there'll be a concert, the Ovation of Peace. It'll be at TIO Stadium. It will be televised by the ABC nationally. And we want this concert to take on the same level of national significance that carols do at Christmas time. Kakadu. When we came to office, one of the first things that we did was write to the Australian Government and the Northern Land Council and say that we are back at the table. Last term, I don't know why, last term the CLP wrote to both those parties and said we're walking away from negotiations around Jabiru. Now for me, Jabiru is a territory town and Kakadu is crucial to our economic future. So we went back to the table. We partnered up with the Conjaintme Aboriginal Corporation and local traditional owners and we kicked down the door in Canberra. We said you must invest in Kakadu. Earlier this year, we saw both the Prime Minister and Bill Shorten announce $220 million for Kakadu. The Environment Minister said their money will flow out over the next 10 years. Bill Shorten said, from our first budget, in our first term, in the first four years. Kakadu can't wait. Someone once said to me, an investment in Kakadu is like having a lottery ticket and choosing not to drive to news agents to collect zero about spending the petrol. We know that Kakadu is a proven tourism product. It used to be over 150,000 international visitors a year. Now it's down to 30. Last year, we saw an example of why. Jim Jim was only available for access for 29 days in August. The investment from the Australian government will go into things like roads. It will go into the road to Jim Jim. It will mean that we can guarantee access to Jim Jim Falls during the dry season, during the shoulder season, and in the wet season apart from flood events. This will significantly change how we can market the Northern Territory, how we can market Kakadu, and how we can market the top end. This is going to be a big difference to the Territory. The last thing, this is more of like a, a pin this. We know the importance of the wet season and improving the wet season for the economy full stop. And we are going to have a significant announcement to make later this year around an event during the wet season in Darwin. We recognise the importance of tourism. 
gas. We have 36 TCF off the shore of Darwin and 500 TCF in the Beetaloo. To put those numbers into perspective, Australia uses just a tick over one TCF a year. So we have enough gas in the Beetaloo to provide energy to the whole of Australia for 400 years. That's a lot of gas. Darwin is already a place of world-class export. We have four trains that operate out of Darwin that we service out of Darwin. We train people in Darwin to work on oil and gas. So for me, doing the same is okay. That's okay. But I think it's critically now that we plan for an even greater return of our gas reserves for the Northern Territory. With that much gas, how do we become a place that makes things, that manufactures things, that value adds to things? Gas makes that real. We've identified 500 hectares of industrial land out at Middle Arm. Paul Tyrrell, as the chair of the gas, gas Task Force and I, have been in boardrooms in Asia, America and on the East Coast. We're talking to explorers, producers, people who do the pipelines, people who do the manufacturing, do the value add. We want to make sure that we're not just a place that digs up and sends it away. We've got to do the next step, the value adding steps to create those jobs for locals, more jobs for locals. To put this in some perspective, I can't give commercial details, but you'll get access to that gas for half the price in Darwin than you would in Sydney. And it takes half the time to get to market Darwin to China than it does Brisbane to China. It makes sense that in that part of Australia, which is closest to the rest of the world, we do our exporting from here, we do our manufacturing from here. This is something that gives us a competitive edge. And we're doing the plans now to make sure we get that return. The other thing that gas can do is make our mining sector more viable, more commercial. And we've seen a pipeline of gas go out to Tanami. Our mining sector now knows that they've got, they can plan for access to gas. We have an advantage. We have running north to south of the Northern Territory, the spine already, a gas pipeline. We want to make sure our mining sector does the next step here too, the value add. And there are a couple of stories we can already celebrate. Our fuel resources has made the decision to not have their separation plant in South Korea, but have their separation plant on site here in the Northern Territory. That's huge for us, that's more jobs for us, that's more better paying jobs for us. TNG, the vanadium mine that's halfway between Alice and Tennant, they're going to do a refinery here in Darwin. Again, the same story, that's good. We're doing this with all our mines and our mining sector. How can we make sure that we do the next step here? We're not just a place where you dig it up and export it, but you value add here in the territory as well. We also want to make sure there's a greater local return out of our mining sector. We've done a couple of things there. We've gone to a royalty scheme to make sure there's an immediate return to territory taxpayers that can be reinvested back into territorians. And we've made a change to our deductions so that you do not get an incentive for a fly-in, fly-out workforce, but an incentive for a live-in workforce. We want more territorians to call the territory home, to live here, to work here. Not just for the GST, that's good. That's very, very good. But we also recognise growing our population is crucial to stabilising the territory economy through the peaks and troughs. We have to grow our population. So for the first time last year, we released a population attraction strategy and we partnered it up with the master brand campaign, Boundless Possible. The reason we did that is our research shows that too many of our fellow Australians don't know who we are. We are too good a secret. And not only do they not know who we are, often their opinions of us are highly offensive and wrong. This impacts on their decisions to live here, visit here or invest here. And we have to change how the territory is perceived around this country and boundless possible is an attempt to do that. I took that population plan to Canberra and we got buy-in from the Prime Minister and from Bill Shorten. And the first tangible impact of that from Canberra is the new designated area migration agreement. There are 117 occupations that have been identified in the Northern Territory, agreed to by the Australian government businesses and unions that can't be filled by locals. Under that new agreement, 500 people can call the Territory home a year from overseas, and they'll be given a pathway to permanent residency. 
but only if they stay in the territory for five years. This is a really good announcement for us. We have to have more people living here for us to reach our full potential. Those jobs not being taken up means there's money in businesses' hands right now that they can't pay out, that they want to pay out, that they want to give to locals. These are pilots, childcare workers, hairdressers, chefs, and on, all around the Northern Territory. We want to make it easier for people to own their own little piece of the Northern Territory. After our last election, we made changes to first homeowners and we saw a doubling of the amount of people who owned their own home in the Northern Territory as a first homeowner. 73% of people said they would not have taken up that scheme if it wasn't for, not bought a house if it wasn't for our scheme. We know incentives work. We also know that our residential construction sector is struggling right now. A lot of our stimulus programs have been designed in and around tradies who do that kind of work, but nothing can substitute for a new house being built. We also know that our economic confidence has taken a hit right now. And a big player in that is housing prices. We know that banks are choosing not to lend at the moment. I was speaking to someone just the other day. They earn $100,000 a year. They wanted to buy a unit in the CBD that was worth $190,000 a year. They had a $35,000 deposit and they got knocked back. I know that if you're worried about your housing price, your primary asset, the thing that's the biggest thing in your life is the house that you own. If you're worried about that, if you're worried about negative equity, it does impact on the decisions you make and the likelihood of you going to out for a restaurant, going out to the local shops. Putting a floor under house prices is critical for the, the confidence of the territory economy. Getting jobs in the residential construction sector is critical for the territory economy. So how do we get more people to build a house in the NT and more people to buy a house in the NT? There is a competitive tension between these two aims. The only way through this is to increase demand. And I can announce today that we have made some changes. We are making our schemes available to more people. We are bringing back a build bonus worth $20,000 for anyone who chooses to build a new house. And we are making it easier for more people to buy into the market. If you have never owned a home in the Territory before, we don't care what you've done in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. If you're in the Territory now, you're a Territory. If you haven't owned a home here before, we're going to give you an incentive. If you haven't owned a home in the Northern Territory for 24 months, we're going to help you into the market. If you're a divorcee, if you've gone through a family breakup, we'll help you straight away. We'll waive that 24 months. We want to make it easier for people to own their own little piece of the Northern Territory. This is going to cost us $12 million, and we're doing it from a redirect from the Capital Works budget across construction for construction. We have to put a floor under falling house prices, and we have to create more jobs in the residential construction sector, and this is our attempt to do both of those. How can we afford this? Over the last few months, there has been debate about our fiscal situation, about our budget books. We invited that conversation by releasing an independent review into our fiscal situation. What that report shows is since 2002 3 Every year, year on year, the Territory government spend has grown at 6%. Most of those years have been good years. Last term, the CLP made a series of fiscal decisions. They sold TIO, they leased the port. When we went into the election last year, there was a deficit of $867 million. That didn't leave much in the tin for the stimulus programs we needed post the impacts construction phase, but we had plans around that. What hurt? was the cut to GST of $500 million year on year. Late last year, the Australian government fixed our GST relativity. What that means is next three years we have certainty. Certainty is a good thing. The bad news is it locked in that $500 million a year GST cut. So as a government, we said we need to reassess our fiscal situation. We commissioned that independent fiscal report. We've got the former Under-Treasurer from Western Australia, John Langerlands, in. 
He's done this five times before most recently for the new Premier Mark McGowan. What he showed in the interim report is that we have to curb the growth in recurrent government expenditure. In the short term, what we're doing to address that is every single CEO is going to report to me as the Chief Minister, as the Chair of the Budget Review Subcommittee, against four priorities. Every program in their budget against four priorities. Is what you're doing creating jobs? Does it cut crime? Does it invest in generational change that we know will reduce pressure on health, police, corrections, territory families? And is it necessary for simply for good government? Based off that root and branch review, I'll be making a series of recommendations to the Budget Cabinet. When you dig into what curb recurrent expenditure growth is, it's pretty simple. There's four departments by and large. Health, police, corrections and territory families. Their budgets are under pressure for reasons we all know. There's a reason why our hospitals are busy, why our jails are full, while police are busy day and night, while families broke up. This year our alcohol reforms are done. This is the last year and they're completed. We often talk about our alcohol policies as measures to cut crime, and they are. But they are also budget repair measures. Abuse of alcohol is something that keeps health, territory families, police, corrections busy. This term, we've got over an extra 100 police on the beat, and we'll have our 120 that we promised done this year. We've employed over 50 liquor inspectors already, and we'll get the other 20 done this year. We've employed 54 youth engagement officers. We've rolled out the more day patrol, more night patrol, justice plans, ASB plans in Darwin, Palmerston, Alice, more CCTV. These things are all necessary. These things are all expensive. We have to deal with our social challenges if we want to get long-term budget repair. This is good for the budget, this is good for the economy. And the best thing you can do to reduce pressure on health corrections, territory families and police is to invest in our kids. All the research shows that's how you get the best return. I'll give you a couple of examples. Our Family Nurse Partnership Program works with parents from about 23 weeks pregnant with a home visit from a nurse for the first two years. This program results in a reduction in infant mortality. Less babies die. It leads to healthier babies. It leads to a reduction in domestic violence. We are expanding our family nurse partnership programs this year. When I was in Catherine, I was talking to an occupational therapist. It was her job to teach kids how to speak in years one and two. Not how to think, there's nothing wrong with their intelligence. But we know through our Families as First Teachers program that if we spend 50 minutes a day reading to our kid, any of us can do that, you don't need a qualification, that occupational therapist wouldn't need to be there in year one and two. That's an immediate expense, OTs aren't cheap. So we know if we invest in our kids, we'll get an immediate return. We also know that if we invest in our kids, they are far less likely to run a market school, to end up at Dondale, to end up in a renal dialysis machine, to end up in the unemployment queue. Investing in our kids is not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And we know future governments will get significant budget savings as a result of it. These are some of our plans for 2019. There's a lot more work ahead of us than this. For the Territory to prosper, all of us must prosper. We know that. Please be assured that we get what's happening in the Territory at the moment and that you have a government that's doing its best to invest in you. Thank you very much.